And Mark, I want to start with you. First, I want you to talk about the survey that, that George touched on, uh, but a little bit more about that and why you did it, and then we're going we're gonna to break it down. Okay. Well, Tony, about six months ago, some of uh, the friends that you and I both know, secular conservatives, came and said, it's this enormous red wave is coming. And that's fine. We looked at some of the data, and I said, well, what's driving it? Uh, from, from what value source is this emanating, the energy that's driving it? Because we know it's not party-driven anymore. And now from what uh, George has told us over the last several years, it's not necessarily uh, religiously driven. And they said, well, who cares? I said, well, I do. I said, what, uh, how are you going to govern if we uh, don't know what the people want and, what they're, and why they're uh, selecting uh, these issues? And they just didn't care. And, and I care for two reasons. One, uh, <clears throat> we can't sustain... Uh, the, the religious or conservative movement in the United States without being able to relate to the people on their personal needs and why they, they're making the choices they are. And second, as you know, I do some work around the world. I think some things are coming in the next 18 months to two years that are, that are <clears throat> going to require leadership of the United States for the rest of the world, not just ourselves. And to be able to relate to the world what we're about and, and why we're doing it. So I called uh, my good friend George and said, we need to commission this poll. We need to find out what does America believe and why does she believe it at this point in time? And that was the purpose behind the research. So George, what did you find out? Well, it's interesting because when we looked at all of this, we looked actually at people's values. We tested 48 different values to figure out what drives people in their daily lives. And amazingly, by far, the number one value across all the different subgroups, and we looked at more than 80 different subgroups of the population, the number one value across all was family. It's the lens through which we organize and orchestrate our lives. And so as people are making their decisions, their thought is, how's this going to affect my family? What can I do that will be best for my family? How is what uh, the people in D.C. and in our state capitals and elsewhere, what they're talking about, how's that going to affect my family? That's really the key thing for them. And uh, uh, second on that list was happiness. So there are two particular things that are driving Americans. It's family and happiness. And there are other things that we discovered that are important as well. But I, I think in many ways, we've misjudged the American people. We think that they're driven by issues. We think that those are the things that matter to them. When in point of fact, they care about their children, their grandchildren, their spouse, what they can do as a unit, that's the unit that drives them in life. Well, could that not be rooted in God's creative order and <laughs> as God has designed it to be? Oh, it is rooted in his order. And we have a great opportunity now to participate with God in this new, this new ordination. And to echo what, what George has just said, it's important to understand, and, and, and we knew at the time we did the research, the American people are, are, feel isolated from their national leadership. It's one thing to say 60% think Congress is corrupt, and that 65% think that uh, all candidates running for office have a, a hidden agenda. But the scary thing is 87% think the country's on the wrong track. Political operatives in Washington, D.C. traditionally look at that and say that's because the op they're mad at the opposition, they're not mad at me. And it's across the board, Tony. Republicans are rejecting the Republican Party, Democrats are rejecting the Democratic Party, and they're not listening to these issues that they're, they're trying to cram down our throats on, on, on just uh, secular and divisive issues. They're retreating into this family unit, this structure, and the difference is we preach family values, and we still believe that, and we still will. What they're saying is, is that the family has value. There's value in the family as a unit, and that's Old Testament stuff. It is. So, so George, this is a discovery for, you know, policymakers and even, even um, you know, Christians that have, you know, we've been focused on the policy, but we're going back to the very foundation of how God created things, and the policies emanate from that understanding. But it's also a, a moment of opportunity to educate as to why these things matter, why the family matters, because most of the, the world does not have that biblical worldview that you talked about. So they don't know that this is in God's creative order that they have this interest. So it's also a teaching moment. 
It is, and you, you know, I mentioned before that we never talk about worldview. People don't reflect on worldview. Americans aren't a reflective people. We're doers, we're not thinkers. We want to accomplish. We don't want to reflect on our accomplishments. We want to keep going. But this is one of those opportunities where we have to help people think about worldview without rubbing their face in it and, and causing them to think, oh my gosh, this is Theology 404. It isn't. This is how God created us to live. And so it's really the natural way when we're in God's plan, when we're moving in his pathway that he's ordained for us. We don't even realize it, but that's right, what's right before us. So it's a terrific opportunity in, in kind of a softer cell approach, if you will, mm -hmm. to get people to think about the things of God by talking about values. So what is the process? How do you envision this conversation beginning so that it, it starts with the family unit, but then as uh, we, last night David Barton was talking about, and I think it was, he was quoting Charles Finney, uh, if I'm not mistaken, about uh, God, country, family, and talking about that order. And you know, some said, well, wait a minute, it should be God, family, country. And his point was that there was an understanding in our nation that you had to keep, you had to keep the country on the right track or it was gonna mess with the family. And of course, that has been the model of, uh, of Marxist communist countries to remove the family because it stands in the way of, of their agenda. I finally, I think, Tony, after all these years of working in national politics, understand why communism's first order is always to eliminate the family, God first and the family second, in, in any process of uh, authority. Why? Because I believe, as Paul said in Hebrews, that he wrote his word and his laws on people's hearts and lips and their, when he created them. They know the truth. What they need is for you and I and everyone else is to support them in the decision-making process and the conclusions they're coming to. So let me give you an example. You, you, George goes through all the different worldviews and families collect, however they collect at holidays or maybe they're living together. And when they get into a, then an issue discussion through their lens of family, what do I want in education for my child f so that they can prosper and participate in society uh, when they're an adult? And they don't start with, well, how do we teach them to be sensitive on social issues that they're not relating to? They want reading, writing, math, science, and then they can have a curriculum on that, like, like gym or something, but it's not the priority. They come to that conclusion. Why? Because it's ordained on their hearts right. and their lips. Right. So our opportunity now is to speak into that structure. And I start with you. I mean, I, it's the opportunity to be here with you is just an extraordinary, and I thank you very much for it. Uh, <clears throat> it's going to take leaders like you and others to, 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 for all of us to look at the world differently. We've tried to impact Congress all our lives. We've worked on it with elected officials all our lives. We've worked on government policy. I still do this internationally. When maybe the structure is going straight to the people and their family structures, and they'll tell government what to do, because they're not listening to the government right now. And so if you think of everybody you see out there when you go to the mall, that they're in a family unit. Now this is, we're talking about 80, 90 percent of the public uh, relates to this. And we speak to them through their lens, through their desires, through their natural inclinations, you, as you say, their ordained inclinations. We may have more success than dealing yeah. with Congress. Well, it, it encourages me because all of these external forces has not eradicate what, eradicated what you just described. God has put this on the hearts of man. And George, you and I have talked about this a little bit. In, um, you're actually encouraged by these results, uncharacteristically. <laughs> Well, thank you for that. Yeah, uh, but you know, when I look at, at the structure of the values that people are buying into, uh, they relate to several larger concepts or narratives, you know, goodness, uh, maturity, stability, responsibility, moderation. And, and so this gives us an opportunity now, we've, we've got another hook that we've got with people where we can talk to them, what is goodness? How do we know what goodness is? You know, we have the opportunity to bring them back to some biblical foundations without them feeling like, oh, he's being spiritual on me again. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, no, we're, we're just trying to unpack what it is that you want. Let's really understand that so that as we're looking at our world and we're trying to figure out what that's gonna look like in very tangible, practical ways, we get it. And from a policy standpoint, you know, we, when we're dealing with educational issues, which we're gonna be talking about later today, it is coming from the mindset of, all right, what's this parent 
really interested in and, and connecting with, with their point of interest. We're going to get to the same place. We're going to bring them over to understanding of this whole transgender ideology and, and the CRT that they're pumping in is, at, is in conflict with the parents, but we've got to bring them to that understanding that this is at cross purposes with what they want. And there's two cross purposes. One is the ultimate conclusion, and the other is their authority over their own family. That was what the Virginia elections were about. Uh, they, want a, they want a partnership. They want to know how we can work together for a better society and respect their authority over their families so they can take it back into that discussion. But let me give you some good news on this, Paul. I mean, we think as Christians that we're up against this wall out there that there's nobody that agrees with us. 65% of the American public today says they're very proud or extremely proud to be Americans. 69% more likely to vote for a candidate that will advocate our values to the world rather than to capitulate to the world's values in a one-world government. I mean, the resistance is out there. The Lord has laid the foundation. We just have to speak into it. Yeah. George, the, the cross tabs on this. Yeah, yeah it's, it's good. And, and that's what we're looking for. We're looking for a, a hopeful, positive way forward, not, not lamenting the past, but casting a vision. I mean, Proverbs says, you know, without a vision, without a prophetic vision, the people perish. We, we've got to have a way forward. What are the demographics lines? Is this across the board? It really is. I mean, we, we looked at ethnic groups, racial groups. We looked at age groups. We looked at educational groups, income groups. It, it, I mean, it, it's the same. So this is a universal people. message. It really is. That, and that's the cool thing to me, Tony, is that what we've identified are things that could be considered common ground. What we have are so many leaders and media pundits who are, are tearing us apart. All they talk about is the divide and why we're better than they are. But the beauty of this is that it shows us, no, 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 we're one people. One of the things that came out of this, a few years back, David Barton and I did some research on the values of colonial America. And in this study, I took those same 10 values that we found of colonial America, studied them again, we found that half of those are still in place. So these are literally the bedrock foundations of America that haven't changed. It's part of the DNA of our country. And so if we stay true to ourselves, first of all, we don't have to fight ourselves, right. but we know also that it's gonna be easier to gather other people with us because these are things that we believe and want in common. Well, this is, this is great news because it is, a, it is a, a, a place of beginning, not the place we're gonna end up, but it's where we can start with common ground and build, build. on that. We've talked about the policy side, and I want to transition for just a moment, George, to kind of tying in with what you were talking about earlier in your presentation about worldview, about uh, churches, and, and how can this information on this understanding of family and the natural order still written on the hearts of man as it pertains to the family, how can pastors use this to begin to help develop and build that worldview in their congregations? Well, I think part of it is recognizing that really the building block of the church isn't the groups that we have in our programs, it's our families. So our curriculum and, and our education and our focus should be on helping parents be the ones that are leading the spiritual development of their children, not the Sunday school teacher. Yeah, exactly. Uh, all we've got to do is support the parents in raising up the future leaders of our nation, our church, our families, that's what parents are charged with doing biblically. And so as the body of Christ, our responsibility is to get behind them, help them, equip them, resource them, do whatever we can to encourage them, to guide them. That, that's real value that we're adding to their life. So to your research that shows that worldview is developed between roughly 15 to 18 months to 13 years, is there any correlation with the fact that the government wants earlier childhood education? You know, well, well as, as, as Mark will tell you, because Mark has studied this, you know, when you look at all of the totalitarian and communist nations of the world, so many of those leaders focus on children. I mean, you, you had uh, Lenin and Marx talking about, give me a child till he's seven, I'll have him for life. You have Mao Zedong, give me a child till he's nine, I have him for life. I mean, you can pull out all the evil leaders of history, if you will, and they've recognized if I get someone when they're young, I've got them for the rest of their life. So yeah, there's no surprise, and it's not a, a random choice right. on the part of government. 
So that's the role of parents, but grandparents play a role in this too. Grandparents are huge, and when I look at the worldview statistics, what I see is here's a group of people who are more likely to have a biblical worldview, who are more likely to say that faith is first in their life, and then to have the time to invest in the relationship, first of all, and then in the development, secondly, of the worldview of their grandchildren. It's a tremendous opportunity. And that's something that the Family Research Council, our Center for Biblical Worldview, is going to be developing this curriculum, you know, not only for churches and small groups, but for parents and for grandparents to help develop this biblical worldview uh, in their children. I, I want to go back. I, I, I'm going to violate every rule of an interview here in that I'm going to kind of shift to another topic in part. I want to go back to your discussion on the pastor's and evangelical pastors, only 51% have a biblical worldview. You asked this question rhetorically, but I'm going to ask it now and ask for an answer. What is an evangelical if you don't have a biblical worldview? You know, what, one of the comments that I make when people talk with me about that is right now the culture is influencing the church more than the church is influencing the culture. And to me, that's one of the greatest examples of it where you have the individuals who are supposed to be providing biblical leadership to the people who have come to them for biblical leadership and teaching. And yet what they're doing is they're embracing the ways of the world. They're softening God's word so that it's more palatable. It's not as difficult. We can meet our standards wrong. Uh, you know, we've got to get back to God's way of doing it. So what does it mean to be an evangelical in our culture today? Not a heck of a lot. So. We, we've got to be very careful of labels of right. any type that are being used in our culture today. Everything's being redefined. So that leads me to this question that I'm going to lead you astray on. A number of years ago, because this term evangelical has become so elastic and the media loves to use it at every election, and so it really, as George has said, 51% of pastors do not have a biblical worldview. Evangelical pastors the basics of being an evangelical, then, you know, what does that term mean? So about 10 years ago in working with us, you developed kind of a, a new terminology that really describes the core of, to use the evangelical word, the real core of the evangelical community, which you would, I think, almost 99.9% .9 of those here would fall into, and it's a term that is called SageCon. How many of you heard the term SageCon? Spiritually active, governance-engaged, conservative. Explain. Well, the idea here is that we discovered, as I was poking through the data, which I want to do, that there's this group of individuals, a significant-sized group, who are driven by their faith. Everything that they're doing in their life, they want their faith to inform it, their faith to propel them forward. And one of the things that their faith causes them to do is to say, I need to be involved in every dimension of the world, every dimension of our society, because that's what Jesus would have done. That's what God calls me to Salt do. Light. Yeah, absolutely. And so one of those is the whole area of government and politics and policy. And they're saying, rather than being a Christian who's afraid of it because it's dirty, it's immoral, it's not, you know, it's of this world, the reality is we have the opportunity as Christians to go in there and flavor it with the love and the heart of Christ. And so we want to be involved in politics. We're going to be heavily involved in politics and government because we want everything that takes place in that dimension to honor God. The only way that's going to happen is if we get active in it. Right. And they're not drawn by party. So it doesn't, it's not, they're not there because they're, you know, hat wearing, Republican, flag waving conservatives. They're not there because of the personality of the candidate, i.e. 2016, one of the reasons that the media just kept scratching their head, why are evangelicals supporting a man who's been married three times? They didn't get it. They're motivated out of their faith, and a lot of times the conversation or the currency is the policies that are promoted because they're consistent with their faith. And there's staying power in sage cons. They're not easily discouraged. No, and what we're finding is election after election after election, uh, again, as I look at, at close to 80 different subgroups in the election research, 
they are always the group that has the highest turnout in the election, and they're always the group that has the most uniform vote for a particular candidate in the election. So if I remember the statistics correctly, in the 2020 election, they were about 9% of the adult population, but 14% of the voters. Turnout, right. Of the turnout, but they were roughly 30-some, 30 31% of Donald Trump's vote. Yeah, and in fact, they almost voted unanimously for him, given the choices that they had before them. But and that's a significant chunk of vote for a candidate. I mean, that is a, a very influential voting bloc. Yeah, I mean, as Mark knows, when you're managing campaigns, if you can get one group that's going to give you three out of ten of your votes, boy, do you pay attention to them. And what was their turnout? Ninety-nine percent. Now you understand why the media wants to discourage you. <laughs> they want to discourage and make the sage cons feel like they're isolated and alone. Well, we're, our time is, is up, but here's, here's one takeaway for you. Are you a sage con? Are you a spiritually active, governance-engaged conservative? Well, here, here's a way to find out. We now have, this is, you're, you are the first ones, in fact, those watching online can participate in this as well. We now have, working with George, we have a survey. It's a, a brief survey, uh, but it will indicate whether or not you are a SageCon, at least give us a good indication. And you can take that survey by texting SageCon, that's S-A-G-E-C-O-N, SageCon, to 67742. You'll get a link back, you can take the survey, and then in a couple of days we'll send you the results once we, uh, we get with our panel of experts and they all go over all of the surveys and analyze them. And uh, so don't put your name on it because we don't wanna be biased in our grading of it. No, just kidding. Uh, just fill it out, it'll come to us, and uh, we'll get you a response. Again, SageCon 67742, you can take the survey and find out whether or not you are a SageCon. Are you one who is engaging because of your faith? I can tell you that's, that when I saw George's definition of that, and Mark, I'm, I'm sure you're probably the same, I would have chosen any other profession than being involved in politics. But it's, I'm here because of my faith, because we're called to be salt and light and to make a difference. George, Mark, thank you so much. Your work is fantastic. It's so informative. We're grateful for you. Thank you.